Hi there, I'm Ross Douthat. I'm a columnist, op-ed columnist for the New York Times, and I'm delighted to be here with you at the 2020 Napa Institute virtual conference. Uh, I am coming to you, as you can see, from my attic in New Haven, Connecticut, where I do all of my Zoom calls and recordings in order to escape from my beloved children, um, who are currently downstairs getting up to some kind of terrible mischief. Um, I want to thank the Institute for having me. Um, I've always been an admirer of the work that you guys do, and it's a pleasure to join you, even if it is in this strange, attenuated form. Um, but I've been promised that as recompense for virtual attendance, um, at some point maybe I can actually appear um, in California wine country in the flesh. So I'm very much looking forward to that at the 2047 Napa conference. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you guys today about decadence. The title of this talk, The Decadent Society, is also the title of my latest book, which came out shortly before the uh, pandemic, shortly before the lockdown. So I squeezed in a little bit of book promotion. And it's only been partially, I think, overtaken by events. Uh, but the basic thesis of the book is that Decadence is a useful concept for understanding what's happened to the United States and indeed the wider Western world over the last 50 years. And by decadence, I don't mean or I don't just mean some combination of um, orgies and gluttony, right? The sort of, you know, chocolate covered strawberries and weekends in Las Vegas definition of decadence. Um, I'm trying to use the term to mean something a little bit more technical, um, with the one sentence definition being that decadence refers to stagnation, drift, repetition, and sterility at a very high level of civilizational and technological development. So for a society to become decadent, it has to have been successful in the first place. Um, primitive societies are by definition not decadent. They haven't achieved what it takes to enter into decadence in the first place. And decadence also doesn't just mean, you know, rampant immorality. Um, it, a society can be immoral and yet dynamic. Um, and, and a society can, you know, the, the America of the 1920s, for instance, um, the roaring 20s of, you know, flappers and Jay Gatsby's parties and so on, in my definition, isn't actually decadent precisely because a lot of things were happening, um, even if people were behaving badly in the midst of change and transformation and growth and development, still change and transformation and growth and development were all um, a big part, a, a sort of defining part of the story. And the argument of the book is that somewhere in the years following the moon landing, um, which is the, the sort of 50-year-old point at which I start the story, the rich countries of the Western world stopped having that kind of dynamism, and they stopped having new things happening, which is obviously a slightly strange claim to be making in the midst of a, you know, once in a century pandemic. But I'll try and defend it even so. Um, I think if you go back 50 years and then trace the story of the United States forward over the succeeding generations down to the present, um, you see four or five different macro level trends in play. Um, the first is a deceleration of economic growth. Um, it doesn't mean economic growth has stopped. It doesn't mean we're all falling into poverty. Um, but compared to the growth that the U.S. took for granted over much of its history, and especially the big boom that followed World War II, economic growth since the 1970s has been disappointing. Um, we had a period of stagnate, stagflation in the 70s that gave way to the Reagan and Clinton booms, but then that in turn gave way to a new period of stagnation long enough for the George Mason, Mason economist Tyler Cowen to hold, write a whole book entitled The Great Stagnation um, about um, the 50-year arc, but also the specific period from 2000 um, into the Trump presidency. So you've had economic growth go from 4 or 5 or even 6% a year down to 2%. Um, you've had a lot of stagnation of wages for most Americans. And linked to that, you've had technological disappointment, which, again, is a somewhat counterintuitive claim, given that we obviously have had some substantial technological breakthroughs. 
Um, I wouldn't be able to attend this virtual conference, um, obviously, if there hadn't been tremendous innovation in the fields of digital communications and the internet and so on over the last generation or so. But if you compare that technological change to what was confidently expected in the 1950s and 1960s, it starts to look less impressive. Um, and here I'm you know, stealing an idea in part from the famous Silicon Valley billionaire Peter Thiel, who has this line, you know, we expected flying cars and we got 140 characters, meaning that we got Twitter, right, and all that, all that that entails. And basically what he and a lot of savvy economists um, argue is that over the last couple generations, Western growth went from being multidimensional to being monodimensional. So we went from having development and technological innovation across a range of fields, transportation, energy, the built environment, to being all tech and nothing else. So innovation is more and more concentrated in Silicon Valley, and you don't have the kind of energy revolutions and transportation revolutions or life extension revolutions, medical revolutions that people experienced um, across the long 19th century and across the early 20th century. Instead, we either seem to have hit a temporary limit on certain kinds of human innovation or some other features in our society um, aspects of our, you know, education system, our national culture, our political system have made innovations harder to come by and harder to implement if you do come by them. And so we live in a world where the next big breakthrough is constantly being talked up in the press and then also seems to constantly recede into the future, whether it's large-scale genetic engineering um, or um, something like the self-driving car, which has been just around the corner for the last 10 years, and yet they still haven't figured out how to make it drive in the rain. These are sort of, I think, features of a decadent economy, as is a general reality that because a decadent economy is rich, you have tons of money still sort of sloshing around. It's just that people don't know what to invest it in. They don't have sort of clear lines of innovation to put money into. And so you get a lot of money spent on, you know, companies like Theranos, right, that sort of seem to have some amazing innovation in the pipeline and then turn out to be basically a fraud. Or more generally in companies that, um, you know, are successful in certain ways like Uber, but don't actually seem to have a path to profitability if they aren't constantly floated uh, by venture capital. So that's the decadent economy. And then it connects to, I think, the less controversial portion of my diagnosis, which is the idea that our political system is decadent, right? That sort of gridlock and sclerosis increasingly define politics in Washington, D.C., and I think in different ways in the European Union as well. And this gridlock has multiple forms, right? Some of it is caused by the growth and age of the American welfare state, the fact that you have this huge system of entitlements and transfers and bureaucracy that has existed for many generations and has developed enough clients that it's essentially impervious to change. Um, that, I think, coexists with a political system that has become politically polarized in ways that makes the Madisonian system of government not function the way it's supposed to be, right? So instead of having the various branches of government check one another, and instead of having a Congress that legislates and a president that fulfills presidential obligations, you have partisan polarization making it impossible for Congress to legislate. And so domestic politics devolves into a sort of contest of executive power versus judicial power. Um, of basically the executive branch and the judicial branch constantly seeing work, seeking workarounds to address policy challenges that the legislature in a well-functioning system would be able to address. I think this has sort of compounded over the last 50 years, but has become, I think, particularly palpable um, in the Obama and Trump presidencies, where the prospect for serious legislation seems almost non-existent. You can get maybe one big piece of legislation passed, and then everything descends into gridlock and into sort of an argument about, well, how much power does the president have to essentially push policy if the rest of the government isn't functioning? So that's the political part of this story. And it obviously feeds back into the economic part. If you have a deadlocked political system, then it's harder and harder to make 
the kind of economic reforms that you would need to get the economy growing faster, um, the sort of neoliberal revolution of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, um, which was sort of the last time you had a large scale restructuring of the economy is now 40 years in the rearview mirror. And it's very hard to imagine either right or left, either, either libertarians or Bernie Sanders style socialists achieving a similar restructuring under current conditions. So the economy just sort of drifts on in its stagnant, slow growth state. The political system drifts on in its gridlocked state. And meanwhile, undergirding this, you have the, the fact of societal aging, right, which is a core part of decadence. The fact that a decadent society is rich and powerful and yet has lost faith in the future. It sees no clear lines of advance. It's uncertain about its actual purpose. And out of that, you get um, people having, for you know, complicated, sometimes mysterious reasons, fewer and fewer kids, not enough kids to reproduce their own societies. And this has been, I think, a clear phenomenon in Europe going back two generations. Um, I think you can argue reasonably that Europe entered fully into decadence before the United States did. And when I was, you know, a much younger man with more hair, American conservatives liked to, you know, boast about how America was exceptional in this regard, that we still had above replacement fertility that was linked to our higher degree levels of religiosity, our stronger civic spirit, our stronger families, our greater civilizational conflict confidence. That's not the case anymore. Over the last 15 years, U.S. fertility rates have converged with European rates. Uh, the pandemic will probably push them lower still. And now the U.S., like the nations of the Pacific Rim, like the nations of Western Europe, is not reproducing itself either. And out of that comes a growing sort of a sort of simple aging of society, right, where uh, the average age of Americans and Europeans gets goes up and up and up, and there are fewer and fewer younger people um, to, on the one hand, support the existing sort of groaning system to pay to pay the taxes that keep entitlement programs running and so on. But I think more importantly, there aren't enough younger people to do dynamic and dramatic change-oriented new things, and the society as a whole because older societies tend to be more cautious and risk averse, is less likely to let them do, do those things even if they want to do them. Um, so an older society then creates further feedback loops that further encourage gridlock. It's harder to change the politics of an older society than a younger society and creates further sort of drags on economic growth because a less, a less youthful dynamic society will be less innovative and less entrepreneurial. And then finally, connected to all of this, but slightly harder to quantify, is a kind of repetition in um, culture. And, you know, I think I write movie reviews as a sideline to my day job for the National Review. So I'm, I think, acutely aware of how this plays out in the movie industry, where especially over the last 10 or 15 years, all of Hollywood has just been taken over by um, a world of reboots and sequels and blockbuster remakes, all of properties that were um, sort of developed, cre creative stories, basically, I'm using the, the lingo of Hollywood. But when I say properties, I mean stories, stories that were first told in many cases, either by the baby boom generation or when the baby boom generation was young. So in the period between, let's say, the 1930s and the 1980s, you get everything from all of the comic book universes that are endlessly recycled now to Star Wars and Star Trek and, and so on through a list of stories that, again, are sort of the stories that now seem to be the only ones that Hollywood is capable of telling. And I think that's a, a sort of um, condensed version of a larger story, right, where you know, we're all living in the aftermath of an original cultural revolution, um, the original revolution of the 1960s and 70s that was carried out by a baby boom generation that at that point was, you know, huge, youthful, intensely creative, intensely destructive, um, and has, has ushered in a world where it's very hard for society to move beyond the arguments that started happening in the 60s and 70s. So whether it's on the right or on the left, most of the great causes that we're fighting about today, from the pro-life movement to the environmental movement, are all causes that emerge out of the crucible of the 1960s 
in 1970s. The political alignment of our parties was basically created but by trends that start with George McGovern on the left and Ronald Reagan on the right, trends that are now 50 or 60 years old. And even figures like Donald Trump, who sort of present themselves as disruptive figures who are realigning the parties, end up being pulled back into those ideological categories. And then in religion, I think you see a similar thing where it's been very hard for Western Christianity to move beyond to sort of resolve and transcend the culture war debates that were touched off by the sexual revolution and by the wider cultural transformation of the 60s and 70s. Um, and I think you can see this particularly in the pontificate of Pope Francis, um, where I think there was a sense prior to his election that the church, you know, that a lot of the questions raised in the 60s and 70s, raised in the Second Vatican Council and its aftermath, um, had been resolved, settled in certain ways by John Paul II and Benedict XVI, and that whatever the next pope would bring, it would be sort of a new chapter in the church's histories, in the church's history. And instead, I think the dynamic of the Francis era has been, you know, whether the Holy Father intends it or not, a constant return to 1975, to the battles of 1975, the same debates, divorce, communion for the divorced and remarried, um, you know, married priests, and so on down the list of neuralgic issues that Catholics have been wrangling over for multiple generations. And I think what's true in the church is true in the culture writ large. There's a constant return to 1975, and even things that seem incredibly novel, like the revolution of wokeness, right, that we're living through in elite institutions in the West right now. Um, if you trace those ideas back to their source, um, you know, the ideas that are most current on the social justice left right now, they're almost all ideas that emerge in a period from the early 1960s through the late 1970s. They're, you know, that come out of the academy in that era, that come out of activism in that era, and they may be gaining a particular, a sort of novel amount of ground at this moment, um, but they aren't nearly as new as they sometimes seem to be. In certain ways, they're just a continuation of an ideological struggle that goes back 50 or 60 years. So that's um, a short but perhaps still overlong um, account of what I mean by decadence and how it describes the situation that we find itself in. And it takes up about the first, you know, third or so of, of my book. And I spend the rest of the book sort of talking about um, both scenarios in which decadence could sustain itself, in which we could be, as I say, sustainably decadent for a very long period of time without having a collapse come along, and also scenarios of transformation, collapse, and finally renaissance, sort of more hopeful scenarios for, for the future. And obviously the coronavirus, the pandemic, sort of resembles some of the challenges and potential stresses that I imagine coming along in the book that could put decadence to the test. And so in certain ways, we're living through a period that's going to give us, I think, a clearer idea of just how sustainable our decadence is, or whether it's destined to end, um, well, in the case of a global pandemic, in some kind of much darker form of um, chaos or collapse. Um, but I think for a fuller account, a fuller account of those ideas, I guess I'd just direct you to the book. And in what remains of our time together, I want to sort of narrow this conversation down, as I already started to do a little, to, to the Catholic Church itself. Um, because I think the Church itself, especially in the U.S. and the West, I think especially in the U.S., is a really good example of what a decadent institution looks like. Right. So, you know, Roman Roman Catholicism in the Western world is obviously the most successful religious institution in the history of Western civilization. Um, it has, you know, it has both a sort of, you know, both the 2000 year history, but also in the case of the United States, a multi-century history as an immigrant church that became in certain ways the central religious force in our nation uh, for a certain period of time. And this is, I think, a 
you know, a particularly astonishing achievement given that the U.S. was founded, of course, as a Protestant country and remains one in various profound ways to this day. And notwithstanding that fact, um, Catholics in the United States were able to build a potent and sort of vast institutional network of churches and schools and hospitals and monasteries and lay communities and so on that has extended all across this country with, you know, integrating immigrants from all kinds of nationalities and languages. And at various points, particularly maybe the period of the 1940s and 50s, also in certain ways, um, I'd say sort of the high points of the pontificate of John Paul II, um, has seemed like the most dynamic force in American religious life. And, you know, I was a convert to Catholicism in my teens in the late 1990s, coming in from mainline Protestantism, but also from some time in evangelical and Pentecostalist worlds. And at that point, I would say the church that I entered, that my family entered, felt that way. It felt like we were entering the most important religious institution in America. Um, and so that's that's the success. But out of success, obviously, you can get stagnation, drift, and repetition, and decay. And I think it's very easy to look around Catholicism in the U.S. and see all of those forces at work now, especially, I think, in certain ways in the Northeast, where I'm from, and in the Midwest as well, where the church was strongest 50 or 60 years ago and has this kind of all of these legacy institutions. But I think that that's the strongest version of a challenge that exists almost everywhere in the church, which is the question of how do you create revival and renewal within a structure that seems, you know, too large for itself, I guess, is almost the way the way you would put it, right? That the, that the church as a structural institution is so much larger right now than the church as a dynamic institution. And there's so much of so many institutions in the church that seem to be sort of existing in a state of slow consolidation and slow decay that may be hastened somewhat by the period that we're that we're living through if people don't go to church for a certain period of time, don't go to mass and sort of drift away, drift away further from the church. Um, but, you know, the church is battered by scandals in various ways that seem to be something that, thanks to attorneys general and district attorneys, something that will, will sort of continue to be a problem, a sort of a force bleeding energy from the church um, over the next generation or so. There's just going to be a kind of inevitable demographic turnover as the baby boom generation, which, you know, for all its sins and faults is still more invested than younger Americans, younger Catholics in the church, as they age and pass to their reward, there will be all kinds of institutional challenges as the oldest cohort of priests passes away and the church has to transition to an era of, you know, created by the low vocation years of the 70s and 80s of many fewer priests. So there's a kind of transition that has to happen in certain ways, but to you know, a, a sort of shrinking process, right, that seems almost inevitable. And yet at the same time, obviously, the actual mission of the church is, you know, resurrection, renaissance, to figure out ways to preach the gospel and renew both society and itself from within. And I think that's an incredibly difficult balancing act for an institution to strike. And it's one, I think, that, you know, presents different challenges in different places, right? So, you know, there's a lot of younger Catholic enthusiasm about ideas, you know, that have names like, you know, Rod Dreher, the Catholic turned Orthodox writer, the writer's book, The Benedict Option, right? That says, well, in this moment, you know, the church needs sort of small communities and institution building from the ground up um, that can, you know, eff effectively create a sort of a, a sort of resilient, resilient centers for Catholic resistance to an increasingly secular and hostile culture. Um, and I think that's a very powerful and important idea, but it's not an idea that you can sort of take up and champion if you are, let's say, the Cardinal Archbishop of New York, right? Because your obligation in that situation is to the institutional church as it exists to figure out how to, you know, sustain and reform this vast complex of institutions for the long run. And you can't just flick some switch uh, 
and, you know, take the church down to its resilient core and build from there, you're actually responsible for all those institutions and all those baptized souls, even if they've become, you know, lukewarm or drifted away from the faith. That's still your responsibility. So I think that's one of the key features of um, Catholic obligations in, in, a, in a situation of decadence, right? That you have to figure out what level you're supposed to be operating on. And to the extent that you're operating at the most local, local level, um, you have different obligations from if you're operating at the highest and most, you know, or the most bureaucratized level. But I think really the core challenge, and I'll sort of, I've taken up enough of your time, so I'll end things here. The core challenge is to find that place, is, is for Catholics who have to work in the place in between, right? Where you're not, you know, you're not starting a, a monastic community yourself. That isn't your calling. Um, you're not building the, you know, the homeschooling network um, that will replace Catholic schools at some point, but you're also not just sort of in charge of, you know, maintaining things as they are for as long as possible. Maybe you are, you know, a parent whose kids are in a pretty good Catholic school and you're figuring out, you know, how to make it more fully Catholic, more authentically Catholic and financially stable at the same time. Or you're in a priest in a parish that, you know, isn't on one side or another of the Catholic culture wars, but is, um, you know, has a mixture of older and younger parishioners, people who want Eucharistic adoration, people who are into social justice, people who want different liturgical styles, and you have to figure out how to do renewal in that context in a way that, that holds things together. And I think that kind of middle ground of Catholicism is where, you know, the choices will be made and the battles will be fought that will determine whether you can get, um, whether you can get Renaissance without collapse basically, which I think is the larger challenge of life under decadence, right? Is that, you know, if you don't want things to just sort of keep going on as they're going, then you even, then you need a way to create renewal without having the apocalypse happen before, before renewal takes hold. And I think in terms of um, those of us who write about the church, um, those of you who are involved in funding projects, around the church, you know, into, who are in charge of initiatives that sort of look for, um, that look for ways to, to create renewal. It's that middle zone, I think, that's ultimately going to be most important to where American Catholicism ends up 30 or 40 or 50 years from now, and whether it achieves that kind of renewal and renaissance that all of us who live under decadence should aspire for. So... I hope that was at least somewhat interesting. I'm very, very grateful for your time. Um, again, I'm sorry to be with you under such peculiar circumstances, but now I better go and see what's happening in my home downstairs. So thank you all very much. God bless you. Bye.